There continues to be a lot of chatter and speculation about the impact of vehicle automation on the UK motor insurance market. Now, a lot of this is currently focused on driverless cars, despite the fact that in the here and now, we've yet to get fully to grips with the potential of Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, or ADAS for short. My name is Jonathan Swift, and I'd like to welcome you to this live interactive webinar in association with National Windscreens, in which we'll put these technologies under the spotlight. So perhaps it'd be good to start the conversation by getting a handle about how big uh, the penetration of ADAS is and how many rotor vehicles today have ADAS systems. Perhaps I come to you first of all, Peter, on that. The, the experience that we see at the moment is that about 10% of the vehicles on the road have um, ADAS systems on them that, that require calibration. Um, the statistics are wide and varying in terms of where that will end up, but at the moment it's looking somewhere between 40 and 50% by 2020, which is only three years' time. Ian? Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Well, I think that uh, figures uh, uh, very much lowballs the situation. I think it's probably closer to 30% uh, plus at the moment. Um, I think ADAS has quite a wide um, uh, kind of catch-all in terms of uh, technologies it encompasses, so AEB, ESC, uh, and all the rest of the various different acronyms. And I think we find that people are probably not aware of a lot of the technology that's on the vehicles at the moment. So I would say at least 30% at the moment, I think that would rapidly grow going forward. And I think perhaps a better way to look at it would actually be the, the, the number of systems uh, rather than the fact they've got a piece of, uh, of ADES technology on them. David? Uh, I agree. I think uh, the official numbers are understated. Uh, and also I think we have a problem as insurers in terms of if something's fitted as standard on a model, then we know about it and we can build that into our, our pricing and claim service. But most of these things are optional extras. Um, at the current time, certainly at the quotation stage, we've absolutely no way of establishing what's fitted to a vehicle. So I think that will be understating the numbers, but also, as I say, will be causing us problems in making sure that you know, if we're going to encourage these things, we need to offer premium discounts, and we can only do that if we know they're fitted to a vehicle. Finally, Adam. I totally agree with the panel so far, but I think the, the vehicle manufacturers often don't have statistics to actually support the current view. Many of these uh, systems are additional extras that a driver selects when he orders a vehicle, and those extras are not always included in the VIN recognition software that exists within the vehicle manufacturer. It's, it's tricky going forward, but I think it's going to grow rapidly because it's a, a step in a journey where uh, we want to reach autonomy at some point, and these systems actually provide the link, the stepping stones, if you like, to get to autonomy. So if I can ask you, Adam, I mean, what can the insurers do to make sure they have a better insight and a better kind of, um, their actual records are actually up to date with you know, the policyholders and what kind of systems they have? Or? Some of the work we can do uh, isn't directly with the policyholder, because as my colleagues have said, some of these people don't know the system exists. Mm -hmm. So we are working with vehicle manufacturers to try and encourage them to develop self-heal systems so as when a piece of equipment <coughs> excuse me, is fitted to a car that's under repair that has the capability of self-calibration. And I think that's the way forward. We have raised it with Archer and certain vehicle manufacturers to test and learn from their experience. David? Uh, it would be great if we could have uh, you know, an electronic list that we could check at quotation stage and find out precisely uh, what was fitted, maybe linked to the VIN, that would be good. Um, but beyond that, I think we need to be working with the manufacturers and the individual component uh, manufacturers to make sure that you know, when we're dealing with a claim, our supply chain can cope with it. There's, there's lots of very highly technical equipment uh, involved these days and we need to make sure that when a vehicle comes in to be repaired it's been dealt with properly and effectively. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's mainly going to be done through raising the consumer awareness and I think the manufacturers have a key role to, to, to play in that. So one of the ways that the manufacturers market uh, the ADES systems are through comfort and safety and I think they just need to expand in terms of the, uh, the value that the systems are, 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 are bringing and make it very clear. Peter? Uh, some, some of the vehicles are dynamic calibration which means you have to drive it um, after the example the windscreen's being replaced and the camera sensor has been calibrated that can take up to 10-15 minutes in certain road conditions at certain speeds as well but approximately 75 percent as far as we're experiencing at the moment does need uh, static calibration and we've talked there about our motor manufacturers the people who really should be informing the the the, the, the drivers about what actually their car has. I mean, you know, they, they buy the car, I think it's, you know, yeah. it's often the 
mentioned, they haven't got a clue about some of the things they've got on the case. Uh, absolutely. I, but the one vehicle that I had experience of this, this week was a Vauxhall Astra, where um, the, that particular model had lane departure warning. But to actually find that information on the manufacturer's marketing material um, is very difficult unless you know what to look for. David, do you, do you think that most manufacturers, as you mentioned, they have got a greater role here really in informing and educating the public? Absolutely, and I think they recognise that they've got a, a bit of a training need with their dealerships. Uh, I mean, I borrowed a you know, test drove a car um, at that had all these things fitted. Um, nobody explained to me what it did, how it did it. I ended up turning a number of them off, which is really quite sad because you know, the way it responds can be you know, quite confusing. So you know, they're the ones selling it. They're the ones that are making uh, you know, good money from these products. I think they, they need to up their game. Ian? Yeah, so the only thing I'd add to that, probably kind of perhaps slightly contradictory, is we see ADAS as very much a stepping stone to, uh, uh, to autonomy. And when you look at a fully autonomous vehicle with no, with no pedals and no steering wheel, we wouldn't expect the consumer or the, uh, the customer to actually understand how the vehicle was, w w was driven. So there comes a point where I think we, we, we can uh, educate people, but a lot of these systems will be uh, active 24-7 regardless. And if you get to the ultimate point, and like I say, where they no steering wheel, no pedals, they won't need to know. You, you say that, but again, being maybe a bit deliberately contradictory, um, most autonomous vehicles, I think, will be a bit like ADAS currently in terms of it will uh, you know, be in control some of the time. And I think there's an argument to look at driving tests, for instance, and familiarise people with you know, the, the technology and processes they're going to be dealing with. I'm particularly worried about you know, the interaction. There was a, a note on... Um, you know, on the news feeds yesterday about uh, the states, uh, United States, some of the um, authorities are getting a bit jumpy about how uh, the GM super crews responds when somebody doesn't do what they're meant to do with a driver assistance system. So, you know, is it right and proper that the vehicle is going to be changing fundamentally going forward and yet yeah, we're saying, oh, well, the manufacturer is, is, is solely responsible. I think drivers need to be properly educated. I would totally agree with that. Uh, I think what <coughs> we've uh, seen is a, a, a technology uh, demand that's come into the market where customers don't fully understand the technology and people who are selling the vehicles explain it in such a technical way that the customer leaves the showroom not really understanding what he's bought. If we don't actually then develop a test to assist these people to familiarise themselves, could even be offline in a computer-aided situation to allow them to actually understand the system, how to use it, what the warnings mean, when to use it, not to use it, et cetera, et cetera. It would actually build confidence in the consumer. And does that, st does that kind <coughs> of move then to, it's mentioned about recalibration, do, the, do, do, do they know that these systems have to essentially be tested and make sure <coughs> they are basically fully up to speed and, and, and uh, working? Uh, in, in our experience, often not. We ha we're, we're telling them when, when they phone up to have their windscreen replaced that we believe that there's a, some form of ADAS system on their vehicle and that um, where it's a, a, static, a, a static calibration, they will need to bring the vehicle into a workshop where traditionally glass replacement has been a mobile service where we come to you with a static um, calibration. We can't do that. You need certain workshop conditions and equipment in order to carry out the calibration. David? I think it's a really interesting topic because it is new technology. Uh, we mm. have to put the safety of you know, our customers and other road users uh, at the forefront, but a number of these components are um, self-calibrating, you know, self-healing, so to speak. Um, and I think over the next couple of years, we need to work probably with Thatcham doing, doing a fair <coughs> bit of work to test these things because, we, we, as I say, we must focus on safety, but we mustn't be building up repair costs and repair times just based on uh, the fact that something's new. I totally agree with that. And I think one of the uh, pieces of work that needs to go on is to fully understand the vehicle park and what vehicles got what systems attached to it, which systems need additional calibration or which are self-heal. And then we could possibly do some kind of communication to the public to make them further aware. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to say, I think this all comes around to uh, consumer expectations. If you had a, a traditional AD type claim, which windscreen is a part, you would expect <coughs> to take your vehicle in, potentially get a courtesy car and have it 
uh, dealt with at a, at a repairer uh, or at manufacturer's uh, workshop. So I just think as the, the windscreens and the technology around that gets more and more sophisticated, uh, we need to kind of shift that uh, uh, that paradigm for the for the customer because I think we're slightly different in Europe in terms of we repair more windscreens uh, uh, roadside than uh, uh, than any other country. So I think it's perhaps more uh, prevalent in the UK, but I think it's about that con that, that customer uh, expectation piece. So if it was a an AD claim, they'd expect to go into the uh, into the garage, and I think we perhaps need to educate people that uh, that may be a possibility, or make sure that we've actually got the certification uh, at the roadside uh, to do it. One, one of the issues we've actually come across recently is where consumers have run cars for years and they've probably had two or three windscreen claims in their lifetime. And all of a sudden they come along with a more modern vehicle which has got technology added to it. And you explain that there's going to have to be some additional work. Mm -hmm. They get confused completely. Yeah. They don't understand what that technology is uh, on the vehicle to do. And they do not understand the word recalibration. That is a, that's very technical to them. So awareness and consumer... Uh, Communication is really vital, but I do think taking it back to the vehicle manufacturer at the point of sale, there's more to do. Yeah. Oh, and where are we with the moment with guidelines with, with regards to recalibration? Perhaps come to you on that, Peter. Thatcham produced a, a code of practice in July this year that, that lays out some pretty fundamental, um, broad uh, requirements for um, repairers to calibrate a windscreen and what advice and information to give to the driver. Um, if it's been calibrated and, and more importantly if it hasn't been calibrated and the fact that they shouldn't rely on that system and, and, until it's been attended to. Does this go far enough? So, so I, th I think the Thatcher and Code is a, uh, is a great starting point. It's very, it's very customer uh, and safety focused as well. So it's actually about explaining to people in terms of whether they do have the technology in there, what they need to do, whether it could be re repaired or not uh, roadside. And I believe they ultimately get a certificate at the end mm -hmm. uh, once it's been uh, uh, complete, completely recalibrated and, uh, uh, and repaired. So I think it's a really good starting point. David? Uh, I think at some point in time we've got to get into the thorny topic of cost. Um, I remember a time when we almost didn't count windscreen claims because they were a volume <coughs> churned through, you know, um, yeah. they could, going forward, be one of the most expensive repairs that we have. Um, and, you know, we, we have to make sure that we always put safety first, but that doesn't mean that we should be running up unnecessary calibration uh, fees. Um, also, I, I think, you know, we, we need to think of customer convenience. And whilst I'm sure there will be a lot of people and maybe, you know, motor manufacturers specifically who quite like the idea of using advanced technology to keep things in their supply chain and maybe you know make things take a little bit longer of hourly rate or that sort of thing um, I think we need to be learning rapidly about this technology and appropriately challenging so that we can control insurance costs and make sure that you know repairs are dealt with as efficiently as they were in the past Adam. the technology that's on the vehicle can be repaired in any repairer with the right technology with the right capability mm. It's, it's education of the repair uh, process to make sure that they've got the right equipment, the right staff, and the right capability to deliver a safe outcome for the customer. It doesn't necessarily follow that you have to go back to a VM site. Many vehicle manufacturers actually don't repair windscreens and recalibrate them. They, off, right. they offload yeah. them to specialists. Yeah. So I think there's a, a two-tier thing here. I think there's also... Uh, awareness within the repair community what technology is required to repair ADA s systems and also how they could actually stop outsourcing that type of uh, revenue stream to make it more profitable for themselves and it would encourage it to be done in-house more readily. And, and obviously the, always, what, what I mentioned is also that you mentioned the cost, there's obviously a cost of the repairer in the sense of yeah. training, mm -hmm. the kind of what the technologies they'll have to bring in-house and does that mean that you know insurers have to work in partnership with a select number to make sure essentially there is a certain amount of volume going through, which means they can obviously do the uh, invest that. I mean, is, is that what we're looking? <coughs> at? A lot of the repairers have the calibration equipment for different systems on the car. It's not just windscreens that are actually attached to ADAS systems. There's other things. A simple door mirror change can require the vehicle to be recalibrated in certain circumstances. Removal of the inner door trim panel just to actually carry out a repair to a door sometimes requires a recalibration because it's got a, uh, the sensor within the door that measures its uh, density of volume. So there's, there's lots of things that they currently have. It's, it's more that people in the past primarily outsourced that type of repair to specialists like Peter's. 
equipment supplier, et cetera, et cetera. But what we, what we need to do is measure the capability based on a volume of vehicles with this equipment on it, first of all. I think that's an important part. Peter? Yeah, in our experience, um, the, the, the cost of the calibration equipment and the, uh, the, the boards that, that are needed around between ten and fifteen thousand pounds each and there's eleven as far as we we understand eleven different types of boards depending on the different manufacturers some manufacturers have more than one board as well so it's a learning process for us all the time in terms of understanding and trying to keep a pace with um, what's coming through through the manufacturers pipeline Ian? Yeah, so I was just going to come back to the, uh, to the point around cost, and I think ADAS generally, and kind of taking it slightly away from windscreens for a moment, is actually uh, potentially going to be driving up claims inflation. Uh, so we're already seeing that across AD uh, and, and our PD heads. Uh, and a lot of that's down to um, the fact that you've got lots of uh, uh, expensive sensors positioned kind of behind the grill in various different places, as well as on the windscreen. And in the event of some pretty, pretty low impact uh, claims, you then have quite a costly repair process to actually repair the technology. David? Uh, yeah, if you look at ABI figures, I think they say that um, damage claims have increased by 25%, you know, the cost over the last three years, which is, you know, um, pretty good growth. Um, and when we look at our own uh, figures and analyse them a bit more, we are seeing um, a much higher level of inflation with own damage claims. Now, to me, that tends to be people driving into the back of other vehicles or other things. So that's suggesting to me that the inflation, the vast majority of the inflation, is coming from the front of the end of the vehicle. And that's clearly where a lot of this ADAS technology is, is fitted. So uh, you know, it, it's an increasing problem, something we need to build in our pricing. But going back to you know, repairers and who's capable, and we've you know, for quite a while now moved more towards networks than individual repairers. Um, obviously, that's disappointing for individual repairers. But yeah, when we started talking about PAS 125, you know, British standards, and even the modern materials that were going into vehicles ahead of this technology, you needed specific equipment and training. And it's only the networks really that are commanding the volume um, that can afford to invest. Do you think in a way this will drive consolidation in that repair sector? I mean, is this something that's something been spoken about for a long time? I, I think so. I think there's been a lot of consolidation al already. Uh, there are always different ways to deal with things. You know, if you look at um, you know, insurance generally, um, you don't have to buy a broker. You can be part of a network, that sort of thing. So, so either consolidation or forming of networks with shared facilities. But again, it depends in terms of if these things become so commonplace, I would imagine that the, the testing equipment and practices would also um, fall in cost and be more widely available as well. With regard to the um, ADAS systems, I mean, what are the benefits then to insurers? I mean, this is get, get to the crux of it. I mean, uh, you talked about kind of the cost and stuff. Is there a benefit for insurance companies? So what is the prime benefit? Perhaps I'll start with you on that, David. Uh, it's, you know, we want our customers to have less accidents, um, and absolutely ADAS is doing that. If you look at automated emergency braking systems, there are various figures around, but the, the one we like are the fashion figures. So um, accidents are reduced by 15% and uh, injuries are reduced by 18%. So even if you can't stop the accident completely because the vehicle's slowing down quicker than a human would able to be, it's uh, reducing injuries, which has to be a good thing. So I think in terms of what, what, it, what is the benefit to insurers, it's, it's benefit to our customers in that there'll be you know, less, less damage claims, lower damage claims, reduced premiums, reduced costs generally. Ian? Yeah, so very much just back that up. So savings across both frequency and severity uh, and driverless and driver-assisted vehicles uh, are safer uh, 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 than, than vehicles driven purely by humans. Um, so the savings are uh, just kind of flow through directly directly from that. Adam? I, I agree entirely with the <coughs> panel so far. I, I, I believe as the number increases, then we'll see less frequency accidents because currently you've got a car park with 60%, 70% of vehicles that don't have ADAS based on the figures we've heard. <laughs> and then you'll see that grow quite rapidly. So you would expect the number of front to rear accidents to decline. Yep. Peter? Yeah, I think the one point that I'd like to make is that the, the real driver, if I can use that, that pun, is the NCAP five-star rating um, introduced this year where any vehicle um, with wanting to achieve the five-star rating needs to have two forms of ADAS, which is predominant lane departure warning uh, and um, Autonomous emergency braking. So the driver has been from a safety, that a safety function, um, rather than something that the manufacturers have volunteered into the vehicle. 
So it's, it seems to me that the, there's, a, there's a gap there in terms of where the manufacturers having to do um, this sort of equipment to, to, to get the five-star rating attributed to their make and model. And again, going back to the education piece, do you think that's why people um, have these systems added onto their vehicles? I mean, do you think they are thinking safety? Is, is that, are they thinking it might reduce my motor insurance premiums? I mean, what is the kind of, what is the, the driving, to use the pun yeah. again, po you know, point that people are, are, are doing these systems or are taking these systems on? I think some of these <coughs> some of these systems that are standard in the vehicle, then they don't have a choice. Um, if they have them as an optional extra, then there's obviously um, a, a will or a need for that that particular driver to improve their safety in that vehicle. And, and some vehicles have more functions available to them to them than others. Ian? Yeah. So I think it, I think it's uh, it's comfort comfort and uh, and safety. And the great thing is about <coughs> the ADES features is if you get the driver who's momentarily um, uh, kind of uh, 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 occupied or whatever. Um, it could potentially kind of uh, uh, save the, uh, the incident. David? I, I think different things for different customers. Uh, but if you think of Volvo, for instance, as far as I'm concerned, their, their entire you know, uh, sales approach is, is based on safety. You know, you, you know that if your family are in a you know, big Volvo, they're going to be safer than in some other vehicle. So I think there is that element. I think there's also the, maybe the convenience play, uh, you know, the... You know, knowing that if you are slightly distracted, you're going to be looked after by a system. Um, but there's, there's potentially another line of approach completely and absolutely. If we're saying we're all convinced, all in agreement, that these things are safer, um, should there not be regulatory pressure? I mean, there already is in terms of AEB on HGVs. But, you know, if we are saying that these um, uh, fitments will improve road safety, how long before, whether it's local authorities or, or government, start insisting on them in, in particular circumstances? Finally, Adam. <coughs> I, I agree with everything that's been said on the panel, but I think that the consumer uh, who currently buys the most vehicles we ADA is the fleet user. So most of the vehicles that are within the fleet market currently actually have ADAS for different reasons. One of the reasons is to enhance employee safety and actually aid for the distractions that go on within a busy business mind as he's driving along a vehicle. Mm. Do we think regulation from you, Peter, is actually something that is feasible, is possible? Do you, do you think that's something that might have to be on the uh, Yeah, I think so. One of the questions that, that, that we've been asking is, is, should calibration come part of the MOT? service you know should, should there be more frequent uh, requirements for calibration certainly in terms of um, probably the, the, the insurance and the insurance world is that the insurer having the comfort knowing that those systems that are in the vehicle are actually operating as they would expect to operate Ian uh, yeah absolutely I think they should uh, uh, form part of the uh, uh, the MOT and finally David uh, yeah, I mean, what we haven't seen yet, um, mainly because manufacturers are arguing these are driver assistance systems only and therefore you know, the responsibility um, for any accident lies with you, but you know, sh maybe we will see a claim where that concept is challenged. You know, maybe <coughs> somebody's done a repair on the vehicle and they've not bothered to calibrate it, or maybe there's, there's something more fundamental to the manufacturer. But you know, maybe because most of the claims we see are, are small little little shunts, little um, uh, bumps and things like that, there's, there's not been that pressure. But if there was a substantial serious accident and the effectiveness of these systems was called, called into question, then I think there would be a legal challenge. Um, and you know, if, if we had somebody seriously injured or, or killed, um, then I think absolutely that could lead to you know, regulatory change and imposition in, in the MOT and other aspects. Obviously, the word the motor manufacturers have come up quite a few during this discussion at the moment. What is the relationship between you know insurers and motor manufacturers and the repairers as we sit here today? I mean, those, I mean, are those conversations something that is very much ongoing? Is do there need to be kind of more dialogue and more cooperation and partnership, um, Adam? We we currently have a great relationship with all the leading manufacturers, and there's lots of different debates and discussions going on, Jonathan. If you look at ADAS, it's only one of a number of things that's actually coming over the wall that actually we'll have to contend with in future claims. Uh, glass used to be the front windscreen, the back windscreen inside uh, of a vehicle. It's now actually you can get a vehicle that's totally the top half of it is complete glass. 
So things like that actually require us to get access to repair methods to make sure that we are currently able to guide network repairers to make sure they repair the vehicle safely. So it's the whole piece, technology is changing the, the vehicle landscape and the capability of the vehicle. And the consumer slightly behind the curve. They're aware of it, but they're not on top of it. And I think that's why the awareness piece is really important. Mm. But I do think what was said about the MOT testing, once a system's in a car, there has to be some mechanism to make sure it's functioning regularly. People don't get their car serviced every year anymore because the intervals are so wide, and it leaves a gap in the market for testing these systems to make sure they're functioning. David? Yeah, I think we <coughs> benefit greatly from the motor vehicle manufacturer's um, uh, relationship with Thatcham as well, in terms of we don't see something suddenly coming onto the market, whether it's uh, a new material, a new piece of technology, um, they will get an advance uh, copy of a new vehicle and they will be able to test it, they'll be able to do repair times, they'll be able to understand the technology, they'll be able to make recommendations and I think that um, is great for us yeah, and great for our customers but also very, very good for the manufacturers. I think we need to recognise the, the almost symbiotic relationship between insurers and motor manufacturers but currently I think it's very good. Mm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's a good relationship. It's uh, it's done on a uh, uh, multiple of uh, uh, of different levels. A lot of it's around the kind of repair claims uh, engagement with that. Manufacturers are very keen to uh, to kind of promote and show all the various different technologies that uh, that they're looking to introduce. And I think it's interesting that uh, the manufacturers are probably employing more software engineers going forward than they are mechanical engineers. And I think part of the engagement that we need to do as the industry uh, in the future is actually starting to understand. Uh, the impact from that technology side of things. So ADAS is driving that, and ADAS is a stepping stone to autonomy, but we need to move away from the mechanicals more towards the, the, the kind of software technological side of things that, that sit within the vehicle. And so far, the manufacturers kind of keep that very close to their chest. Um, I suggest that because you've got a lot of uh, other players starting to come into the market, so Tesla obviously from the motor in industry, uh, you've got Apple, Google and the likes. I think that uh, the motor manufacturers are feeling uh, quite uh, vulnerable at the moment in terms of what their offering is and whether their vehicles are going to be white labelled going forward. So there's a lot of things from the infotainment system to the kind of software uh, and the connectivity that it is kind of actually quite closely kept and we find it difficult to find out exactly what's on those vehicles uh, that enables us to price and uh, to, to repair them. Simon, please. I think I heard this morning that the latest uh, model of the Ford Fiesta has 15 different variations of the, an ADAS um, system on it so yeah you know, it's, it's getting more and more complex and it's getting across the wider range of vehicles <coughs> than, than we ever experienced before. At this point I'd like to come to the uh, viewer questions um, as I said before this is a live interactive webinar so if you do have a question please put one forward for the panel uh, and we will come to these questions uh, and the first question really is about um, the panel's view on this is from uh, David Partington about um, cu uh, customers uh, failing to have vehicles uh, recalibrated. Do they see that as a breach of quality conditions um, to keep it in roadworthy conditions? Um, so this is from David Parton from Zurich. Um, do you have a view on that, Ian? Yeah, so ultimately I think that needs to be tested in court. I think the policy conditions say you need to keep your vehicle in a, uh, a good state of repair. Uh, and I think if somebody knowingly or willingly uh, had the ADAS system or the, or, or the windscreen technology that wasn't uh, repaired at the time, particularly as per the code of practice that had actually been advised that that needed to be the case, I think that could be a breach. I'm less sure if they're unaware that it's on the system uh, and unaware that it hasn't been completed, but I think we need some test cases to, to work that through. But I think it's a really good question, and I think it's indicative of the type of challenges that we're going to see uh, going forward. David? I, I just worry when we talk about <coughs> test cases. I mean, I know they're absolutely necessary, but um, I, I think if somebody knowingly um, doesn't do something, then you know, there, there's a problem. But um, I think we have a responsibility, and the motor manufacturers have a responsibility, to emphasise the importance of these things. Uh, I, I think in the current state, we've already discussed and agreed that people don't have a clue half of what's fitted to their vehicles. So I think it would be a you know, sorry state if we were then you know, trying to avoid a claim um, because you know, they, they hadn't done something that maybe they weren't fully aware. Uh, but we do know that you know, these things can be quite expensive uh, and uh, therefore I think you know, if we are going to be um, reliant on things being kept up to date, recalibration, testing, all that sort of thing, you know, maybe we need to mention it specifically in our, our marketing and policy documentation. <coughs> the, the vehicle isn't fully autonomous yet and therefore it will still perform effectively without the system. So I'm quite comforted that the system exists where the standard driver can actually bring the vehicle to a stop, do all the things that he would normally do, 
uh, somebody who absolutely goes out of his way not to recalibrate something, I, I believe there has to be a mechanism to bring it to his attention as a requirement. But I think the panel are right mm -hmm. at this stage. We don't know enough about it, and actually the awareness of the general public is not there to actually reinforce that type of message and taking steps to avoid claims. Mm. Yeah, I think that the, the code of practice does go some way to uh, forcing repairers to, or advising repairers to advise the customer that the system needs calibrating. Uh, and we indeed do issue advisory notices to customers who have refused, for whatever reason, to, to have the calibration undertaken. So there is a, the, the, that information going back to the to the customer and ultimately your policyholder. The follow-up question comes from um, uh, Mr. Cresswell from the um, ABP Club, uh, chairman of the ABP Club. And um, he, I presume it's he, asks, um, how many thousands of vehicles do we think on the road with ADAS systems fitted have had a windscreen changed and um, uh, haven't had it realigned? I mean, do we think there is a decent percentage out there, a small percentage? Many thousands would be the number I would throw out there. Yeah. And, and we won't be aware of what that number is. The uh, Nobody knows what that number is, yeah. but it will be many thousands. Yeah, I, I, it's it's worrying. Um, but if you think if you've got something free or when you bought a car or you've bought it second hand, so you've not uh, chosen uh, you know, a particular functionality or you've not been prepared to pay for it, and then somebody presents you with a, a, a bill for um, you know, realignment or testing, then I can see that you maybe would think, well, I don't want that. Um, but again, coming back to Adam's comment, um, the presence of this system is in addition to you know, the standard vehicle, and therefore, um, it's, it's, particularly if we're not rating for it in the first place, if we're not discounting our premium, should we be that concerned? I think we should be encouraging them to keep things up to date, but these are things that are you know, over and above the, the standard safety features rather than absolutely fundamental to road safety. That said, as the technology moves on, it will become more and more fundamental and then for, therefore maybe we'll have to take a harder line there. I think when the technology does move on, to pick up on David's point, the car will get to a point where it won't allow you to drive <coughs> where a system is actually critical to its safety. I think that's what's getting developed as we speak. I think consumers are largely fleet owners and those fleet vehicles get sold more readily than any other vehicle. So the second and third user of that vehicle maybe isn't aware that that system exists on the vehicle. Mm. And we've got to be mindful of that. So I go back to the beginning and say, this is about education and communication. The code of practice is the first step to actually make a robust repair facility aware of what their requirements look like. So communication with the customer at that point and also within our ethanol systems, we have large discussions with customers to make them as aware as possible. And I'm conscious that Peter's team pick up as well conversations with the customer. So I feel a message is beginning to spread and it'll be just a matter of time before we actually box it off. Mm. Talking about numbers, nobody has any numbers that can explain to anybody what the sort of volume out there is. It'd be pure guesswork. Yeah. Peter, do you? Yeah, I, t I totally agree with the rest of the panel on that. No nobody really knows and, and that's <coughs> a major concern, I think. As we begin to build up a better um, database of vehicles with and without um, these features in them, we, we, we're recording vehicles that have been calibrated and um, successfully and the ones that haven't, and if not, why not? And s hopefully early next year we'll be able to give that information back to the insurers um, so, that, so that you're aware of vehicles that are on the road that have not been calibrated. <coughs> One of the questions that's coming up here quite a bit actually is about um, uh, a market-wide change in approach to increasing windscreen excess or AD excess and someone's even posited the idea that um, do you think the cost of recalibration will see a time when windscreens are actually insured separately um, as a separate product because of the cost going up. Again, I don't know if David you want to take that? Uh, I, I think it would be completely wrong to have it as a separate product. <laughs> uh, yeah, it might be a sneaky way of getting your premium uh, reduced a bit for the cost comparison sites, but I, I would worry that people would end up not opting for it at inception because they didn't realise the value, so that would be very sad. Um, I, I do think we are seeing a step change in terms of um, windscreen claims, uh, but it's, it's not just about the windscreen. Uh, and again, we as insurers need to remember that, yes, individual claims costs are going to go up, but the presence of these things is going to reduce costs overall. So we've got to you know, bear in mind that sort of <coughs> swings and roundabouts approach and make sure that whatever we do doesn't encourage bad practices anywhere. 
um, else and uh, you know always has the you know the customer at the heart of what we're doing. Yeah, yeah so um, I think windscreen excesses have uh, for a long time they kind of failed to keep up with, uh, with claims inflation so they've been ridiculously low compared to what may be a comparable AD excess so I was a minimum bring them up to, uh, to the level of AD as we've already said windscreen is just a subset of, a, of an AD claim so you could start to think about using that uh, in the same kind of way. Would I deal with it separately? No, absolutely not. I agree with David. I think that would just be, uh, uh, that, 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 that would just be, uh, be foolish. Peter? Yeah. I'm really in the hands of these guys <coughs> that do the insurance on, on the level of excess. Um, all we do is collect the excess and uh, that, that's, I guess, the, the extent of our involvement in, in excess issues. Adam. I agree with the excess should be, remain as it is, but most of the ADAS systems that are on a car are actually not in the windscreen anyway. They're around the front of the car or largely in front of the car for pedestrian safety. So just uh, increasing an excess or doing something to the excess for a windscreen probably won't actually capture all your ADAS exposure. Yeah. So another question or subject that's come up is the obviously the whiplash consultation, which has obviously um, finally been announced. And I just wondered um, uh, if we think there's a role for ADAS within those discussions, within, within the kind of the <coughs> consultation, um, which obviously, you know, focus really on bringing the cost of motor insurance down. Uh, I don't know, Adam, if you have a view on this. I haven't really thought about it that largely, to be honest with you, but what I would say is that any consultation that's looking at a vehicle and technology and claims has to be all-encompassing, so it shouldn't actually exclude ADAS. Yeah, David? Uh, my concern is when you look at the claimant lobby, they'll argue anything to try and stop the reforms going through and therefore you know, some of our you know, very positive uh, predictions in terms of the reduction of, 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 of accidents are, are already being cited um, against us. I think regardless of uh, the number of uh, claims that we see out there, there's, there's a problem with um, whiplash in the UK at the current time. There's uh, yeah, an opportunity for too many people to earn off of other people's misfortune and therefore I hope that we would see costs reduced from two sources, one by the whiplash reforms being properly implemented and enforced and also from ADAS becoming more and more common and uh, reducing uh, claims frequency. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think uh, you've got the potential for telematics. I mean, we haven't talked about telematics as part of ADAS, but I think if you've got telematics in the vehicle, I think there's a potential for understanding better uh, the circumstances around the incident itself and potentially the G-forces and, uh, and other forces involved to prove or disprove the whiplash. So I think that's, uh, uh, that's very positive. We've already said that uh, ADAS is going to uh, reduce frequency and reduce severity, so it should reduce the opportunity um, uh, for, for whiplash as well. And when uh, Thatcher recently did some testing looking at uh, uh, AD cars, so uh, a combination of AEB and adaptive cruise control, they actually found out that even driving up to, uh, to 80 miles an hour uh, in moving and stationary tests, uh, you could almost avoid a collision entirely with a combination of AEB and adaptive cruise control. So I just think the incidences of whiplash will be far smaller um, and hopefully if there's any form of telematics in there, we <laughs> may well be able to disprove it uh, completely. So I think it's very positive in terms of what ADAS will bring. It can only be positive. So I think it's a real delay, that the, it's a real shame that the uh, uh, proposals have been delayed again. Peter? Yeah, echo exactly what's just been said, that any form of uh, mechanical assistance that, that, that the vehicle has in terms of autonomously make emergency <coughs> braking or uh, adaptive cruise control must help you guys in, in terms of reducing the, the level of claims. So another question that's come up is really about um, motor manufacturers saying that calibration has to be done, and this has come up about, has to be done within their own kind of repair network, and what the view is on that. I mean, I know we touched about it earlier, about the fact that we, you know, I think this adds, ex adds excessive cost into the, the motor claim. I mean, do you think that is, this is a, something that they will continue to hold on to? I, th I think they will continue to try and hold on to it, but if you speak to the individual component manufacturers, then some of them will tell you uh, that these units don't need to be tested. They don't need, uh, because of the vagaries of you know, motor vehicle usage generally, they make them um, so that they, they adapt and are self-calibrating. I think at this point in time, it's still new for us and we, we don't want to risk anybody's safety, so we're sort of going along with it. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point in time, there's going to be a bit of a challenge to that. And if the units are that intelligent, that yeah, they don't need these additional tests, then after a period where we've established that is the case and have got confirmation from Thatcher or other bodies, I think we should then be saying, right, okay, we will only be carrying out those tests on the units where they're absolutely necessary. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think manufacturers will continue to push for it because I think it's a revenue stream and I think they want to kind of keep cl uh, close to the, uh, the process, as we said earlier. Um, other critical parts of the uh, uh, safety of the vehicle brakes, et cetera, are kind of done outside manufacturers, workshops, uh, 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 insurers uh, uh, provide warranties on, on work done. So I don't see any different than any other piece of work that's done. And I think really good point from, uh, uh, from Adam earlier was that these are only uh, kind of assistance systems at the moment anyway. Um, so they've perhaps got a, a slightly less of a, uh, uh, the urgency perhaps of actually kind of making sure you, you fix some of these brakes correctly. So manufacturers will continue to hold on to it, uh, but I think we, we need to resist. Some of the vehicle manufacturers outsource some of the servicing and repair to independent factors anyway. Uh, so that defeats the object. But I've met uh, people who repair cars over many, many years and independent body shop chains and repair chains don't actually set up businesses to repair cars ineffectively. They make sure vehicles are repaired correctly and safely to return the, the customer to the state that we're in pre-accident and, and give them a level of confidence. Peter? Yeah, I think the, 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 we, we get some dealers referring vehicles to us to have the, uh, the, uh, the cameras calibrated. So I think the dealers are in, in, in as much dark as, as anybody else is in some cases. There's a question here from um, actually one of Ian's colleagues, Joseph Mills from RSA. I don't know if that name rings any bells. But um, uh, Joseph asks that obviously with ADAS, some manufacturers are using their own versions of, say, um, lane control, for example, um, with different limits exceptions. And asks if there's anything <coughs> done to allow insurers to understand the differences between the manufacturers, both from a technical and safety perspective. So, you know, there's obviously differences with all these ADAS systems. I don't know. Ian. Oh, well, no, Adams. I'll pick up. Yep. <coughs> that's, that's some of the work that Thatcham undertakes on behalf of the insurance industry. So a vehicle manufacturer, as David said earlier, provide a, a new model to Thatcham. They take the vehicle apart and understand the systems, and they develop repair mechanisms along with the vehicle manufacturer that are validated. So vehicles come in on the market with different technology, and that's one of the challenges we face, that they all have different technologies. <coughs> that's not a problem as long as you know how to repair them effectively. Um, if you look at the detail uh, on some of the fashion work, it's really, really uh, informative. So um, we all say AEB is great, and you know, I quoted some general statistics earlier on, but um, Thatcham are able to tell us that different units perform differently. So you know, Bosch unit might be better in a, you know, um, a higher speed situation, and another unit might be better in a lower speed situation. I think as time goes on, we will need to understand those those individual factors and you know, we will be relying on Thatcham to not just test that things are okay, not just do the repair times, but actually you know, give us a, a view and an opinion that we can then build into our products. And hopefully if they're able to tell us um, which <coughs> components uh, are safer, then you know, the, the um, reflection in Euro NCAP and in insurance group rating will then encourage other manufacturers to go for the, the better safer components? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with that. I'd only say it's not just about the components, though, because the recent tests that uh, Thatcham did where they looked at uh, four vehicles, so it was Tesla, Infiniti, uh, uh, Merck, and, uh, and a Volvo, um, and they looked at it, and again, the stationary and the, and, and the moving scenarios with the, uh, the assisted driving features, and the vehicle that came out best in those tests, we asked the question at the end, was that because they had the most expensive sensors and the most up-to-date technology? Actually, they didn't have but it was just the way that they were using the software algorithms in the background and they were constantly transmitting information back so that they were actually programming the vehicle to, to use the, 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 um, uh, the ADAS more, uh, uh, more, more, more appropriately. So I, th I think the components is, is interesting, but I think, and we said earlier about uh, uh, manufacturers employing kind of software uh, uh, engineers, that is a big part of it going forward as well. <coughs> so you can do some very clever things with the, the algorithms without even touching anything mechanical. Finally, Peter. Yeah, I think it, there's a lot of unknowns, and, and we're we're sort of on the on the edge of this in terms of glass replacement. And you know, glass, has, as has been said before, has traditionally been just the, the some constituent parts of the body of the vehicle. Now its profile is is raising because because of ADAS, and we're having to keep up to speed with it and and learn all the time. So if I could ask a question, I mean, essentially, I mean, we've obviously talked about the penetration now. We've talked about where the penetration is going. I mean, uh, obviously the view is here, ADAS is here to stay, and it's obviously going to be you know, a, very much a part of the market market going forward. Do you think if we, when we sit down here in three years' time, we'll be talking about penetration, you know, 60%, 70%? Will, 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 this, will actually ADAS not even be a discussion anymore, because ultimately it's just essentially as, as the norm. Will it be a new norm? I mean, Peter? 
Well, I think the thing that's caught a lot of people out is everybody's been talking about driverless cars, and that's sometime in the next five, ten years. ADAS is something, as we've said, is, is here and now, uh, and we're, we're having to um, get up to speed in terms of what equipment is in a, uh, in a vehicle when it comes off, off the production line. So you know, nobody really knows where this is going to go. We all know in theory that it's going, it should go to driverless cars, but in the meantime, we've got to adapt as to what, the, what makes and models are having these various um, safety features brought into them. Okay. I think it will be more BAU uh, uh, in three years' time. So I think ADAS is the, the, kind of, uh, the kind of catchphrase that lots of people are talking about at the moment. I see a lot of these kind of technologies and the, the landscape changing under three headings of uh, connectivity, complexity and autonomy. I think in three years' time we'll be talking more about the, the, the closeness of autonomy. So I think in 2025 we will start to see autonomous vehicles on the road. And I think that the journey we're on at the moment with ADAS will just start to stack up mm -hmm. until we get to that fully level four, level five autonomous vehicle. So we will still be talking about it. Uh, we'll be talking about individual kind of cleverer, uh, better functions that sit past a bit. But I think we have our sights more firmly set on the kind of end game for some people, which is uh, full autonomy. David? I think there are sort of conflicting forces at work here because um, you know, everybody wants safer cars, but people will always want cheap transport. And uh, you know, I don't think uh, we'll move quickly to a position where vehicles are, are, you know, cheap and affordable vehicles are outlawed because they don't have, you know, the latest technology fitted. Um, that said, when you speak to the individual component manufacturers, because they're shifting more units, costs are dropping, absolutely dropping. I was speaking <coughs> to one chap and he <coughs> was suggesting that one individual component that was quite commonly used over an 18 month period, the uh, unit production cost had dropped to it was less than 10% of what it had been 18 months previously. So you know, there's, there's always going to be people leaving things off to keep costs down. But if we do have the high volumes that we're predicting, then hopefully they'll, you know, the cost will become almost negligible. And that's when I think it will be you know, BAU sort of fitted as standard. Um, in the next three years, <coughs> some manufacturers claim that they'll produce a vehicle that nobody will be killed in and nobody will be seriously injured in. If they're able to make those type of comments, and I've been to the plant that actually made those comments, the technology exists. They're currently running 600 vehicles, learning every day about what the driver actually does when he's driving a vehicle. Whenever they get the information to a certain place, they will refine the systems, and by using volume, they'll actually contract the cost downwards. They'll drive cost to the right level. Therefore, it'll become more affordable. But the advantages of this equipment in the future will be the car can tell you who's at fault in an accident. It could tell you many occupants were in the car. It can also stop the car and it can do various other things. So we are only beginning to see the technology change now. And in three years, if you look at global technology changes, I think we'll be sitting here shaking our heads wondering what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, gentlemen. Well, I'll say thank you very much um, for, for taking part in the discussion and for answering the viewers' questions. So I'd like to thank very much uh, Pete and I'd like to thank Ian, I'd like to thank David, I'd like to thank Adam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Just to remind you um, that uh, as part of or preceding this webinar, we did do some research with National Windscreens, uh, which was we then um, placed some articles on. You can read these articles on Post Online and Insurance Hound at www.postonline.co.uk and insurancehound.co.uk as well. So those are very much worth reading. But until the next webinar, it is goodbye for me. Thank you very much for watching. Cheers. <laughs>